I just finished restoring this IBM XT. This is a very late 5160, built just a few months before the introduction of the IBM PS2. This machine had some issues with rust and a short on the motherboard. It also had a faulty floppy drive controller that we were able to fix. As you can see, it cleaned up really well and is now fully working. Inside the IBM we found a working hard drive and an AST3G card that can do MDA, CGA and EGA graphics. The hard drive still has its original content from 1986. But that's okay for now because it already came with a bunch of DOS games installed. However, when we turned the system on, the display made an unusually high electrical noise and I decided to shut the system down to avoid filling up the studio with magic smoke. So something isn't quite right inside this display. Today we are going to restore this IBM CGA display. If you want to pause this video and watch the restoration of the 5160 first, you can find the link in the description below. There were several display options for the IBM XT. The fluorescent green 5151 display, the 5153 CGA display, and the highly sought after IBM 5154 EGA display. To me, the perfect match for the XT is CGA graphics, because I'm already using the MDA display with a Hercules card in the original IBM PC, the 5150. And games made for EGA graphics typically require a much faster 5162. There are some tricks and hacks to get around this to some extent, but that's for another video. The 5162 here is yet to be repaired and restored on this channel. So hit the bell icon below this video and set it to all if you want to join me in that project too. So let's get inside that display and see if we can fix it. Okay, let's see what we will find inside. So the first hurdle is to remove these plastic pieces. And they are made from a different plastic than the rest of the case. And these are incredibly fragile. But let's see if we're lucky today. And we are. This one didn't break. So this piece here tends to break off. And on some displays, these are not painted, so they yellow very badly. But not on this display. So as you can see, it has been painted in the same color as the rest of the case. And this display has two nasty cracks on top of the front bezel. One on each side. So we're gonna have to glue them after we have cleaned the case. Now let's see if we are lucky on this side too. And it broke. Crap. Well, I guess it's not a huge deal. We can always glue it back on. And there's plenty of space on the inside here to make it stronger with some baking soda. But let's clean everything before we start repairing stuff. And then of course we'll have screws hiding away underneath those plastic caps. And since we're going to take this display completely apart to clean it, I'm going to remove these knobs too. But I don't think you need to if you're just servicing it. And the rest of the screws are underneath the display. So I have never serviced one of these. But I have serviced and restored several 5151s. So I'm guessing they are quite similar to disassemble. But then they are of course very different inside. And the usual boring disclaimer. Please don't poke around inside power supplies and CRT displays. They may contain high voltages, even with the cord unplugged. And I'm gonna leave these two screws in place for now, because they may be holding the PCB in place. So let's try to open up the case without removing those screws first. And see how this goes. And I think I was right. And I really like what I see. This is a very reasonable amount of soot for a display from 1984. Yes, definitely better than expected. Awesome. Good start. And this tube is made by Hitachi. And this display did not pop, so it seems to be discharged. 
And this is not the most service-friendly display I have seen so far. A lot of the wires and cables seem to be soldered in place. So this could be a bit challenging. And this is clearly the power supply. So let's see if we can remove it without having to desolder a bunch of cables. I can see some connectors. So maybe we're lucky. And to get access to some of those connectors, we have to remove this shield first. But perhaps the PCB and the power supply would slide out in one piece. But let's try this first. Oh, that's interesting. It looks like my guess was wrong. Those are not reefers. Those safety caps are some other brand. And I tend to take a lot of pictures when I do a project like this. Because it's so easy to forget something. Yeah, those are definitely not reefer branded. That is something else. So, what made that nasty noise? Yeah, definitely a lot more stuff in this display than the 5151. Yeah, it really looks like the PCB and the power supply comes off in one piece. So I'm gonna have to disconnect as many cables as possible and try to remove both of them in one go. If I can, that is, because some of them are really hard to reach. So let's try to remove the entire bracket that holds the switch and the pots on the front panel because the wires are soldered at this end and I can't seem to reach them at the other end at all. Yeah, that's probably the way to go. So if we remove this screw here, I think the power supply will only be attached to the PCB and the base plate because I think I have removed all the connectors and cables and now I think we can remove these two screws underneath and uh, perhaps slide that base plate out. And this display was a bit smelly inside, so it definitely needs a bath. And I forgot the connector with the wires that go to the neck. So let's try again. Uh, yeah, we've got the ground strap. Uh, that damn thing is soldered. Crap. So we actually have to desolder two wires to get the PCB out. That's pretty crappy. And there we go. So let's try again. And uh, now it worked. So let's get that tube out next. Okay, pool noodles ready. Let's get that tube out. Okay, I still can't see anything obviously wrong here. So let's remove this shield here and have a look inside. So this is obviously the rest of the power supply. And hopefully something is obviously wrong inside here. If I can figure out how to get inside, that is. Okay, what have we got here? And again, I can't see anything wrong in here. Aside from a resistor that is running way too hot. But that is not uncommon in old power supplies. Okay, I'm starting to think here that perhaps that display just made a very nasty noise waking up for a very long sleep. Who knows, it may have been turned off for decades. So maybe I overreacted just because I blew up my 5154 very recently. And the same thing here. That is some other brand, so these are not reefers. So I think this display is safe to test. Okay, let's turn the power on and see how this display sounds. And I can't remember if I have ever tested this display, so I don't actually know if it works. Okay, fingers crossed. Well, it's loud and clear, and it does have an unusually high pitch. I grew up with these damn things, so in most cases I can't hear CRT displays anymore. But on this display I can clearly hear the high pitch noise. Well, we might as well test it and see if it works. And it does. So that's a nice bonus. Okay, so I decided to have a closer look at this display. And it turned out to be in an incredible condition. So the camera is just about an inch from the display. And this image is so nice and stable. So I actually think I'm gonna use this display instead. 
That was a very nice surprise. Yeah, the image quality on this display is perfect. Okay, let's put this thing back together so we can test it. And before we put the tube back in, we need to glue these cracks. So first I'm just going to glue it together. And then I'm going to make it much stronger by adding super glue inside. And then some baking soda. And this creates an incredibly strong bond. And the same thing on this side here. And let's reinforce this side too. Very cool trick. I don't remember where I picked this up. But I'm glad I did. Because this has saved me quite a few cases. Okay, I had a minor glitch with the camera about a minute ago. So what I decided to do was to bring out a second CGA display for comparison. And as I mentioned in the video, this tube turned out to be in a remarkable condition. So what I have done now is to put the tube from the second display into the case from the first display. And this display looked even better inside. But I did some cleaning anyways. And now it looks brand spanking new inside. So before we get back to that first display, let's try that AST card and see if it can show EGA graphics. Okay, so here's Larry in CGA mode. Now let me reboot the game and force EGA mode. And to force the game in EGA mode, I just started the game adding dash E. And yes, it does. That looks way better. So that AST card was quite defined. So if I try to force the game in EGA mode with the IBM CGA card, I just get a black screen and the music. Damn, that speaker is loud. So yeah, I'm definitely going to use that AST card in this machine instead of the original CGA card. That is for sure. So I guess I'll reassemble the first display and we'll see if it still makes that nasty noise. Okay, and we're back at display number one. The one that made a noise. And it's partially reassembled now. Let's just turn it on and see what happens. So, IBM on. And fingers crossed. And it does make a very loud high voltage noise. And now it went much quieter. And now it went away. Well, it seems to be working. Normally, although it needs some adjustment up in the corner here, that text is a bit skewed. Let's try it in EGA mode. Yeah, this display too looks perfect, but there is a small difference. This corner here and actually this side here too needs some minor adjustments. But otherwise this display is working perfectly and that high pitch noise is gone. So is this normal for the IBM CJ display that has been in storage for a few decades? Let's turn it off and on again and see if that high pitch noise comes back. Not really, no. That sounded pretty normal to me. Okay, so I will let it cool down. And we'll make a cold start and see if that makes any difference. Okay, it's the next day. So let's try a cold boot. No, it's actually a lot less noisy now. So, is this normal for a display that has been in storage for a long time? So, I would say this display sounds pretty normal now. Okay, so we now have a fully working system with a working display. Let's try out an upgrade. So, one thing that would make this machine much easier to try out with different software is to add a 3.5 inch double density drive. And I think the controller that's in this machine, together with the latest BIOS, will support this drive. However, this is a high density drive, so I'm not sure if this will work. Let's give it a try. So to make this work, I'm going to use an adapter like this one. That will convert the edge connector cable to the regular diskette connector. And then I'm going to use a homemade adapter. So we can use the Molex we have. And unfortunately it's a bit of a tight squeeze. Oh crap, that, that is tight. I'm going to have to remove the drive. Just to test this drive. Because we don't have more than two Molex. One is hooked up to the floppy drive and one is hooked up to the hard drive. And I can't pull it out. 
or can I? No, I can't pull it out without removing the drive. And to remove the drive, we have to remove this hidden screw underneath the machine. And we need to remove all the cards to get access to the screws on the side of the floppy drive. The AST card and the hard drive controller and the floppy controller. And now we can remove the screw on the side of the drive. And to test the drive, we have to put all the cards back in, like so. So now we can connect power through the Molex to our diskette drive. Okay, let's give this a try and see if it works. Okay, let's see what it will do. Well, we've got the usual beeps and RAM count. Let's see if it will boot to that DOS diskette. Well, it seeks and it reads. So I think this might work. And it does. Excellent. So we can use a high density drive as a double density drive in these machines. So I'm gonna exit out of here. So the next thing I'm going to try is to format the diskette. Because some of the versions of the BIOS for these machines have an issue formatting 3.5 inch double density disks. So let's give that a try. So let's try with a fresh diskette. Invalid media or track zero bad. Huh. That's not great. Let's try with another diskette. And this seems to work, so that was just a bad diskette. And format complete. Awesome. Well, in that case, let's install that drive in the machine. Okay, so let's get all those cards out again. And take that disk drive out. So now we need to remove this box here and replace it with our brackets. And hopefully this will work. So I have a bunch of vintage brackets like this one, but they are all white. So I thought I would have to grab one of those and respray it. But a viewer pointed out to me that these are still made and sold on Amazon for next to nothing. So if you're watching this, thanks for letting me know. This saved me some time. And these screws are pretty crappy. Actually, let's see if we can use more modern screws instead of those original IBM flathead screws. Well, maybe they are not quite entirely recessed like these are, but I think it's worth a try. Okay, let's see if this will fit. And it doesn't. Crap. So this bracket here is slightly larger than the original drive. And I don't think we can install it this way either. No, we can't. That's too tight of a fit. So our bracket here is slightly too wide to go through this hole. Okay, I did a comparison here. And the width of this bracket is the same as a CD-ROM drive. So apparently the standard width changed slightly over the years. It's not much, it's just a few millimeters, but it's bad enough. So I'm either gonna modify this bracket here or respray one of my vintage brackets. Well, I did some thinking and I think it's going to be very difficult to cut this edge and make it look good. And uh, the edge here is visible. So I just don't know if I can make a clean enough cut to make it look good. So I'm gonna go with a vintage bracket and respray it in black. Unfortunately, they are in storage. So no three and a half inch diskette drive today, unfortunately. But at least now we know it works. So I'm definitely going to make this upgrade. Okay, so I decided not to be lazy. So I went into storage and pulled out some spare brackets. And unfortunately, they are the same width as this modern bracket. So I don't know when they made this change, but none of these is going to fit in the 5160 either. So I'm gonna have to figure out how to make these slightly narrower to fit our IBM. And to just cut these edges off is an easy task, of course. But I'm not sure how to go about this to make it look good. So I'll do some thinking and try something out. 
So there will be a follow-up video about this machine, where we will make it a bit faster, make a clean install and install some DOS games. So I'll figure something out and we will install this drive in that video too. Well, in that case, I think the next step is to make a clean install. But before we do, let's check out the games that are installed on this machine. And aside from Larry, we've got Electronic Arts Golf. So let's give this a try. So let's see if we can figure this out. Let's try practice. Okay, and it doesn't give any instructions. That was a horrible shot. Uh, without the instructions, this is impossible. And I think I hit the tree. Okay, so this isn't working. Let's try something else. Okay, let's try good old Tetris. And by the looks of it, there is an EGA version of this. Yeah, good old Tetris. I haven't played this game for decades. So I'm not doing too well, I'm afraid. But hey, it looks pretty good. Uh, making some pretty bad choices here. Oh, I think this one is going to save me. At least for a few minutes. Or maybe I'm just lucky. Yeah, I'm definitely lucky. <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's see what else we've got. All right, Space Invaders. Are you using a color monitor? We sure are. And it's CGA graphics. But this is Space Commanders, not Space Invaders. Oh, this isn't the real deal. I have only played this game on the Commodore. This is probably a cheap clone. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Okay. Kong. Oh, this isn't the real deal either. David's Kong. <laughs> this is a cheap copy too. Yeah, definitely not the real Donkey Kong. This is some cheap clone. Oh, this is really crappy. This game looks like it's homemade. Probably by a kid. And it's very sluggish. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Copyright Atari. So this looks like it's the real deal. Yeah, this is a decent version. And I still suck at this. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Okay, so what is this? Hard Hat Mac. Never heard of it. And I need instructions. Press key for left. Okay, right, up, down, jump, and drop. Okay, so basically program the keys. Let's try again. Well, this looks like it could be fun. Although it seems to require at least some learning. Hey, how am I gonna get over here? Uh-oh. Oops. Yeah, this was actually quite fun. Oh, there's an elevator. Well, that helps. Uh-oh. Okay, so I could grab that thing. Okay, so I'll figure this out later. Let's see what else we've got. Okay, we've got Blackjack. And it doesn't look too good. Oh, you're kidding me. This is a horrible version of Blackjack. No, I'm not even going to bother. Let's keep looking. Okay, let's try chess. My chess, IBM PC color version 1.2. Let's give this a try. Wow, this looks pretty basic. That's not very impressive. Let's keep looking. Okay, PC pool. Let's give this a try. And again, no instructions. 
So I'm going to have to guess. And uh, this wasn't impressive at all. The version I had on my Commodore 64 back in the day looked a lot nicer than this. And I'm lucky, so <laughs> I scored a point anyways. Okay, let's see what else we have. And the last game I found on this system is good old Alley Cat. And that was the last game. So aside from Larry, this list of games wasn't too impressive. So now is a good time to watch part 1, where we repaired and restore this IBM XT. If you are watching this in the future, there will also be a link here to the follow-up video, where we will upgrade and overclock this machine. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons. You guys are the best. If you want to support this channel too, consider becoming an early supporter on Patreon. Links are in the description below. Thank you for watching, like, subscribe and leave a comment.